Greetings and hello, welcome back. It is a uh, gorgeous Saturday afternoon as I am taping here down here in Somerset County. Of course, it always seems like the skies are a little bluer in Somerset County. Uh, hopefully you're having uh, as radiant of a day out there as uh, we are here. Progress and civilization are two words for you, two concepts the average person may attribute to, I don't know, uh, but probably not to eras uh, before the time of Christ. Over the next two weeks, uh, we're going to be looking at the development of the, uh, the world's oldest cities, and, uh, and to no surprise, uh, they develop along riverbanks. Uh, if we had a live class, uh, I would probably give you guys prediction guides on what you think is going to happen. And we'd go back over them uh, after class to see uh, as a closure to see what you predicted right. That would be one of them there, right? It'd probably be a slam dunk. Um, correct answer for everyone. Uh, this week, we will be dwelling on two civilizations, right? Next week, uh, we got a couple more, but uh, we're gonna be uh, one developed between the Tigris and uh, the Euphrates rivers, uh, which is today modern day Iraq. Uh, biblical historians um, tend to believe that was where the um, biblical uh, historical Garden of Eden was uh, located with Adam and Eve. Uh, also, we're going to be taking a look uh, at the area developing along the, uh, the, the, the Nile River Valley. And of course, that's, and we're talking about uh, Egypt there. So take a look. We'll get, we'll get, we'll dive into this. Uh, take a look at the photograph on page 58. And uh, you're going to take a look there at a, or a, uh, I guess that, yeah, I guess that's a photograph there. Don't have that in front of me right now. Uh, page 58, the uh, photo of your rook, right? They have a photo, photo there. Sometimes your authors have illustrations. So turn to that and I'll get the uh, screen share up here and we'll get, uh, get ready to see what's what here. Okay early cities along the uh, river basins. There we go, show my little side panel there. So early cities, early cities along river basins, uh, given these new conditions in the relatively short period between um, you know, 3000, 1000 BC, uh, three major uh, urban developments took place in the Tigers uh, Euphrates Basin in Southwest Asia and along the, uh, the Nile River, which flows into the Mediterranean Sea and in the Northwestern uh, South Asia by the Indus River, which we'll take a look at uh, next time. And you can look at map 2-1, take a look at map 2-1 in your textbooks um, to um, connect this. But in addition to the new social organization uh, in these expanding settlements, new technologies uh, appeared. Uh, the, the wheel, for instance, the wheel was used uh, for pottery and the movement of vehicles uh, and metallurgy and stoneworking produced tools and and uh, luxury products, writing, uh, another technology facilitated uh, administration and communication. And Map 2.2 will uh, corroborate that point. Greater divisions of labor. Greater divisions of labor. The agri this agricultural uh, surplus and these new technologies facilitate labor specialization as individuals could uh, devote their time to producing specialized products that they could sell to others, right? Well, some early forms of capitalism maybe there. Uh, urban and rural communities were interconnected and independent, interdependent actually, very interdependent. Uh, animal products and crops 
as well as other uh, natural resources came from the countryside uh, into the cities and manufactured goods were sold and were traded to the countryside. Uh, in addition uh, to trade and consumption, uh, these two ways of life uh, were linked by family connections, uh, politics, and, and religion. Pastoral nomadic communities. Alongside these uh, settled agrarian and urban communities, uh, you had pastoral nomadic communities. They grew and uh, moved uh, from Southwest Asia across much of Afro-Eurasia, which we uh, looked at last chapter. So in contrast, uh, they remain small and without large public buildings, these communities, or much infrastructure uh, at all. So they moved cyclically from highlands to uh, lowlands and uh, maintain connections with uh, agrarian communities with which they could exchange animal products for grains, pottery, and, and tools. So on the steppe lands of Inner Mongolia uh, and Central Asia, these communities focused on animal breeding and herding or of horse, sheep, and uh, cattle, and uh, when agriculture uh, proved, proved challenging. Now, when it was challenging, uh, fishing, hunting, and small scale farming provided a secondary source of food. Uh, and, and these were not, um, these were not passive. These were not passive, uh, non productive actors. Uh, rather, their movement over vast territories connected uh, cities and facilitated the spread of ideas uh, in uh, Afro Eurasia. Now, between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, modern day Iraq at this time period uh, called Mesopotamia. So within this large uh, geographic and human context, the world's first complex society uh, emerged in Mesopotamia between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Uh, the region was well suited uh, to the growth of cities. Uh, uh, though the rivers were unpredictable and, uh, and difficult to navigate uh, when controlled with irrigation, they could uh, support a rich agricultural system. The region was also well located, uh, providing access to neighboring regions. So the revolutionary uh, irrigational system developed here by an engineer corps uh, used levees to control the rivers and, and then ditches uh, and uh, canals to divert water so that uh, vulnerable crops would not be overwhelmed during, uh, during flood season uh, with these very uh, un, uh, with it's uncontrollable, unmanageable, uh, these two river systems. So then stored and channeled water could be used to sustain crops during their drier season. Uh, over on page um, 65, you can see the caption there of early uh, Mesopotamian waterworks. The crossroads of Southwest Asia, though they had the resources to manage agriculture, uh, Mesopotamia was uh, deficient in most uh, natural resources. So to construct its cities, it depended in large part on trade uh, with, uh, with regions. So to this end, it imported cedar from Lebanon, uh, copper and stone from Oman, uh, copper from Turkey and Iran, and uh, lapsus lazuli and tin from uh, Afghanistan. We're talking about lapsus lazuli, um, like an emerald, a blue emerald. The physical openness of Mesopotamia's boundaries eased the movement of uh, people and goods in the regions, uh, making it a crossroads. Uh, it led meanwhile to the growth of its cities. 
several important cultures developed in this context. The Sumerians in the south, the uh, Hurrians in the north, and the Akkadians in the west. The Sumerians, probably your first known people group, right? First known people group. Uh, many of you are familiar with the book of Job. Uh, Job, probably the oldest book. I think it is the oldest book in the Bible. Job was uh, from that that era, and uh, that is where uh, that was. That that uh, book was uh, actually written. The world's first cities. As populations grew, many migrated from the rural areas to these um, city centers. Um, at where new opportunities uh, were, were possible. Uh, the early, earliest cities of Sumer, which I just spoke of, in the south included Eridu, uh, Nippur, and Uruk. Uh, these cities gradually uh, grew over hundreds of years, uh, often as clusters of uh, mud brick buildings uh, that were built up over time. Uh, in fact, in, in uh, Eridu, uh, for instance, its uh, temple was uh, rebuilt at least 20 times, I think around 20 times, uh, each more elaborate uh, than the last. Uh, such temples were at the center of your uh, Sumerian cities, and they were points of worship and uh, for the accumulation of wealth. Uh, to which inhabitants devoted their attention and, uh, and resources. So the, the basic urban model that resulted was the, was the city-state. Uh, all told, more than 35 city-states developed in this period. Uh, these were roughly equal in power and uh, each had its major divine sanctuary and uh, guardian deity. So in addition, uh, to the temple and office buildings located at the edge of the cities, the uh, center city was organized uh, around a uh, around a canal, where different craftspeople uh, worked, and in this way, city states were both commercial and uh, religious centers, and this captured the social hierarchy of um, society in the city. Page sixty-seven, you can see a layout of uh, Eridu. Gods and temples. Sumerians and later Akkadians uh, believed their gods had, had uh, in, initiated all of this and could, could control everything around them for good or, or, or ill. Uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, a um, second millennium uh, composition captured this worldview. Uh, each day's city god was housed in its major temple, and its inhabitants believed that their god determined the uh, city's character, its, its institutions, uh, its relationships with neighbors, and uh, general welfare. In fact, um, in a live class I'm having right now elsewhere, in another institution, we're in an introduction to humanities class, we're focusing on the arts, so we're really focusing on the Epic of Gilgamesh, and that is their uh, required reading for the week. And I'm kind of thinking about maybe uh, placing that on uh, your uh, course page, that uh, if you're interested, you could uh, take a look at that as well. So if you see it there, it's not there now. If you see it, you know, I've changed my mind and placed it there. But it, nevertheless, the, the temple, took the form of a large scale stepped ziggurat. And by 2000 you know, BC, this was flanked by buildings for priests, officials, laborers, and servants. And it was thus not strictly a, a not a strictly a re religious site. Uh, there people engaged on the God's uh, estate. That's what it was kind of looked at, uh, you know, yes, in quotes there, right? The God's estate will do that. Uh, in productive and commercial activities, which uh, employed a large workforce in uh, agriculture and uh, manufacturing. 
Uh, you can see the ziggurat on page 68. Royal power, families, and social hierarchy. Uh, in addition to the concentration of uh, spiritual and economic power temples, royal palaces emerged uh, around uh, 2000 BC on the edge of cities to uh, concentrate royal, secular, and military power. Uh, as with the gods, only elites could access these uh, spaces. Uh, the royal cemetery in Ur, mentioned that earlier, Job's town, uh, reveals the extraordinary status and power uh, of these individuals. Many sacrificial victims and uh, large quantities of food and manufactured goods uh, demonstrate the elite's power on earth. Uh, on page 69, you can see the death pit, a little sketching of what this probably looked like, the death pit. 1237 from the royal tombs of Ur. The social hierarchy uh, to uphold this uh, social system in which the privilege had special access to economic and political power, a complex system of laws and order existed. Bureaucrats and priests supported this system and, and served the rulers. Uh, within this system, there was a uh, highly specialized uh, and clearly established set of occupations that determine your social status. Uh, at the top were the king and the priests. Uh, underneath them were bureaucrats and then supervisors and uh, the various um, craft workers. And, and finally, the largest group of workers within households. So, uh, though possible, uh, to move among the classes, it, it wasn't common. Hierarchy of family households. Uh, the basic unit within this society uh, was the patriarchal, patriarchal household uh, dominated by right, the patriarch, the senior male um, in this patriarchal you know, environment. Households were single family and, uh, and held together uh, by a contract between spouses. Uh, though monogamy was the norm, uh, sometimes men would take a second wife or slave woman to bear a son. Uh, alternately, adoption could be used to acquire a male heir. Uh, wealth was passed on to sons in equal shares. Uh, daughters married into families uh, for which they received a dowry. In other words, a dowry, if uh, she came into the family uh, as uh, you know, a property owner, and then she would bring uh, that to her husband uh, at, uh, at marriage. Um, although a woman too, uh, on this point, although a woman uh, was always subordinated to uh, some man, if not a husband, it would be her brother uh, or her father. And some women became temple priestesses and could control uh, estates and enterprises. Most, however, lived in, in uh, these contract marriages. First writing and early texts. The first writing, the world's first writing system was developed here, obviously, in Mesopotamia, I'm talking about it first, maintained by scribes who occupied powerful, powerful positions uh, in this social hierarchy, just below the rulers and, and the priests. This, this early record keeping, this early record keeping and reading was in the form of cuneiform, cuneiform, and you can see it over on page 71. And you can see it was a uh, wedge-shaped uh, writing carved in the, in the clay tablets. Uh, at some point, these images were linked with sounds. And, uh, and, and those sounds with meaning gave birth to you know, a written and spoken language that could be used to track trade and property. Quite remarkable, actually. And it also allowed for these ideas to be embedded in literature, 
uh, historical records and, and sacred texts to uh, move across distance, distances and uh, be preserved through time. Uh, records from between 1000 BC and 2000 describe the political structure and economy of, um, of ancient Sumer. Cuneiform could also be used by speakers of different languages uh, beyond the region uh, to the same ends. Again, page 71, you can check that out. Uh, these also could be, uh, could capture a community's identity and beliefs, right? Very important for historians, such as the documentation of the Great Flood, which described the demise of uh, Auruk as the God's will. And uh, probably should add that uh, many of these old societies borrowed much uh, from uh, the writings of uh, Moses, hence the Great Flood. Spreading cities and the first territorial states, cities begin to unify uh, in the states. Uh, the Sumerian city-states were the most powerful in the second millennium and the competition for resources and trade uh, drives their growth, drives their growth. Uh, however, the, the constellation of uh, city-states changed under the conquest of King Sargon, King Sargon of the Great of uh, Akkad, who unified Southern Mesopotamia into the world's first territorial state. Uh, a, it was a multi-ethnic collection of urban centers. Uh, its geographic influence increased greatly under his rule as did the new period of architecture, architecture, art, and, and, and uh, literature sponsored by the state. Uh, Akkad uh, captured and uh, it was captured uh, eventually and its territory uh, and territorial state fell a um, century after his death by peoples hailing from the uh, Zargos Mountains, revealing a struggle between the urban centers and populations on the margins of states. And you can check out with this map two, three on page 72. We're gonna move now to Egypt, our second civilization we're gonna be taking a look at today second and last one today, um, ancient Egypt, the gift of the Nile. Ancient Egypt emerged along the Nile in the third, third millennium as a melting pot, drawing diverse peoples uh, from the deserts in Sinai and Libya on the Mediterranean, Nubia and Central Africa to the south. And this led to, led, led to the blending of uh, culture, cultural practices, and, uh, and technologies. Although Egypt's development shared much with Mesopotamia, uh, its distinctive geography made it different. Uh, as in Mesopotamia, it had, it had dense populations invested in monumental arch architecture, uh, granted tremendous power to rulers and elaborated a complex social order. However, its desert environment can find it to uh, the limited land that you could cultivate right uh, along the Nile and especially near the Nile River Delta. The Nile River and its floodwaters. The Nile is crucial. The Nile is crucial to understanding Egypt. Uh, it is the longest river in the world at more than 4,000 miles. Uh, it's two branches the blue and the white uh, near Khartoum. And you can see this in the map of two, four, figure two, four, map two, four, the, they meet near Khartoum from which it flows uh, into the, uh, the Mediterranean Sea. Now people have lived close uh, to it in order to benefit from its annual flooding and uh, escape the infertile hinterlands of, uh, of Egypt, making it the most popular um, of the uh, most popular residential areas uh, in, the, in that region. 
Uh, it also makes it the most river reliant, river based uh, culture um, in the world. So in contrast to Mesopotamia, uh, the Nile's flooding was much more predictable, right? Leading to a worldview that was more optimistic. Again, map two, four on page 75 helps that point. Um, Egyptians used uh, irrigation basins to uh, trap their water. Uh, regular flooding created a new and uh, reliable layer of topsoil uh, combined with the persistent sun, uh, which the Egyptian worshipers for this reason uh, used for abundant harvests. And that was the norm actually. All right, Egypt. Because of its geography, Egypt uh, developed quite differently than Mesopotamia. Uh, its deserts to the east and west, sea to the north, and waterfalls to the south made it uh, much less accessible and uh, open to trade. Uh, it developed a more cohesive uh, common culture than Mesopotamia. Uh, organized in part around a dynamic between Lower Egypt in the north and Upper Egypt uh, in the south. Um, the former was uh, the black soil uh, of the north, the latter the red sand and disorder of the south. Uh, Egyptians thought of this opposition though as a, uh, as a challenge, as a challenge that required stability or order known as ma'at. Yes, it's the way you say it, ma'at. Egyptian state and dynasties. Egypt, Egypt developed quickly and a semi-divine pharaoh uh, was looked at to uh, be responsible for protection and uh, prosperity, kind of a god slash king. The king was supposed to control nature, like the flooding of the Nile, as well as protect Egypt from invaders from the desert in the south. So to support the pharaoh's rule and manage state and economy, a large bureaucracy was organized and labor and public works as well. So all told, there are 31 dynasties that carry these original rulers uh, down uh, to the conquest of Egypt in the fourth century BC. So these, um, these have been arranged by scholars into an old, middle, and, uh, and new kingdom, if you please, uh, each marked by a breakdown of authority at some juncture uh, in a first, second, and third intermediate periods. Uh, on table, on page 76, table 2-1, you can see a breakdown. Pharaohs, pyramids, and the cosmic order. Somewhere in the second millennium, uh, the third dynasty launched the old kingdom, consisted and considered the golden age of, uh, of uh, ancient Egypt. And in this period, in this period, uh, the ruler was conceived as a god uh, with divine powers. So to emphasize his power, uh, rituals were performed on monumental architecture, such as the Sed Festival, uh, which was served to renew the king's vitality. Uh, you had King Dossier, uh, had this performed at his tomb complex in Saqqara, a step pyramid and uh, precursor to the pyramids is what that basically was. So such rituals emphasize both the divinity of the king and the unity of Egyptians uh, beneath him. Uh, under the fourth dynasty, under the fourth dynasty around, uh, you know, early third millennia, uh, the grand pyramids at Giza were built. Uh, the pyramid of Khufu became the the uh, largest stone structure in the world, uh, requiring huge amounts of well-organized and coerced labor. 
So the capacity to build these uh, reflects the power of Egypt's centralized authority and surplus resources at the time. Page 78, you can see the pyramids of Giza. The gods, priesthood, and magical power. Uh, in the Egyptian worldview, uh, gods, kings, and the rest of humanity inhabited the world. Uh, each region had a god represented by a king during his lifetime. Some had broader appeal across regions, such as the god of Ammon. Now, over time, these gods evolved and became symbolized by animal and human symbols. Uh, for instance, Horus, the hawk god, Osiris, the god of regeneration and underworld, uh, Isis, uh, ideals of sisterhood and motherhood, uh, Hathor, the god of childbirth and love, Ra, the sun god, Ammon, creator, the hidden god. A reciprocal dynamic uh, held humans and gods together, religious practices at temples, uh, worship at the gods, they worship the gods. Uh, and the gods responded with favor to the king, uh, which was then passed on to uh, all humanity. Uh, priests served the crucial role within temples, uh, controlling all communication uh, with the gods in elaborate rituals that required extensive training. Common people also practiced popular religions, which depended on the use of magic, uh, such as amulets, omens, and divination at local shrines. Uh, amulets were worn on the, or were on the bodies, uh, acting as a charm against uh, you know, some kind of evil. Page 79 uh, augments that point, these points. As in Mesopotamia, a small portion of society became scribes, mostly those who worked in the court, army, or the priesthood, though some kings and royal families also became literate. In addition to its economic function, writing was soon used for making historical records and literature. So training became extensive and began at a young age uh, with the copying of texts and then literary works. Uh, for the upper classes, uh, it was a sign of intellectual achievement. Uh, people were even buried with their textbooks, believe it or not. So it took two major forms, uh, hieroglyphs, hieroglyphs used in formal royal and divine writing, and then uh, hieratic writing, hieratic writing, a cursive script, right? A cursive script, uh, more common for record keeping, uh, writing letters, uh, hymns, and poetry. Uh, this popular or, or demotic, not demonic, but demotic. Uh, writing was crucial for deciphering the Rosetta Stone in the 19th century. And you can see page 80 uh, for that. And lastly, I got my uh, screen there. I apologize for that. There you go. Writing and, and scribes. Prosperity and the demise of the, the old kingdom. There was a remarkable prosperity uh, in this period uh, in which the population grew from 350,000 to uh, 400,000, and then to 500, or, and then to five, um, then to 5 million, eventually to 5 million around. Oh, 1000 BC, so a pretty big jump and within a powerful state and uh, it was well-functioning, a uh, well-functioning bureaucracy, uh, essential to managing all these resources. So as Egypt grows, 
centralization begins to break down. And amid an extended drought, internal weakness leads to collapse. Pepe II was the last ruler of the old kingdom um, in uh, you know, around two, 2000 BC. This led to a first intermediate period and in which local magnates, lo local magnates held power and violent regional struggles, violent regional struggles played out. Nonetheless, the institutions and beliefs of the old kingdom persisted and would be revived. So if you have a graphic organizer, um, this is gonna be completed at the end of next week. We looked at the rivers, cities, and first states part one, uh, the river based, uh, river basin cultures, shared basic features, but they take different paths, right? Tigris and Euphrates, the immense floodplains, difficulty sustaining their populations, and need for large hinterlands. Cities vied for prominence, uh, leading to rituals or rivalries, leading to rivalries. Uh, shared basic features, but taking different paths over the Nile, Egypt, Nile River Valley, smaller cities, but more political and more political stability. Uh, social landscape changes in the first and second millennia. Uh, giant rivers are irrigating the fertile lands. Uh, complex cultures emerge, uh, expanding populations, uh, occupational special specialization, social hierarchy, rising standards of living, uh, sophisticated systems of art and science, and productions of clothing. Ceremonial sites and trading crossroads become cities. Uh, they develop religious and political systems. And then your um, social distinctions, right? Men and women, country and city folks. Next week, we will fill that in when we look at uh, part two of the chapter. Let's take a look at um, where we want to go and uh, what is uh, uh, what is up ahead in this um, particular chapter. We want to answer these questions. Uh, you might want to do that uh, as a wrap up and help uh, your uh, assist your reading and uh, discussion questions. Uh, identify the earliest river-based societies. You can probably do that now since we lectured. Uh, analyze uh, their shared and distinctive characteristics. Uh, explain the religious, social, and political developments that accompany early urbanization. Again, if you were in my live class, this would be an exercise I have called Ticket Out. Right, I would have you answer these. To see how well you grasp the, um, the lecture. Okay, let's uh, look at what's up ahead now. All right, you have your graphic organizer there. As you read, um, reading will supplement the lecture. Pages You're reading pages 57 to 81, which I'm considering part one of chapter two. Have a short video that will, su just supplemental stuff that will, um, you know, supplement the lecture and the readings called Early Civilization, a couple minutes. Uh, Wednesday night's debriefing. I'm still trying to find a, a name for that, right? If you want to uh, get together with me via chat, Zoom, um, something more in depth than an email, having some trouble understanding something, can, got some concerns, uh, let me know ahead of time uh, between 7 and 9 p.m. Thursday, your review quiz will, will be. Um, won't be due to me, but it's going to end at 11.59. So uh, I'd like for you to do that uh, before you do the discussion questions, right? Get those in. Uh, Friday, you'll be able to see the um, correct answers. And then Friday night, your initial um, discussion post is due. Sunday, response posts are due. Be mindful of the sliding scale, right? I have that on the tentative schedule section of the syllabus. Uh, we want everyone contributing to this. Uh, if you're not jumping into that till Sunday afternoon, it's going to cost you points, right? And then we will begin uh, Monday, I should say there, 
uh, chapter two, part two. So again, uh, any questions, comments, you can email me. Uh, but if you, something deeper you want to discuss, uh, uh, you can catch me Wednesday night, all right? So until uh, next time, you guys have a fantastic week and um, see you next time.